Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Cheetash. My name is Chris, and today we are continuing on with our journey through the one thing. Moving on to chapter four, talking about the lies that they tell us about multitasking, focus, success, getting things done, etc. Last time we spent talking about just the introduction to this book, the book, The One Thing, uh, again, written by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Gary Keller, the gentleman who started uh, Keller Williams Realty. And in the introduction, we went over some some concepts about the one thing, how it doesn't necessarily have to be a thing or a goal. It could be a skill, a passion. It could be even like a person, like one person just sets your life in an entirely different direction towards success. One passion, if you are really devoted to one thing, you spend more time on it. Consequently, you progress along so much in that passion that you end up spending more time on it. And then this concept of success breeding on success. Something I mentioned last time was the compound effect, the snowball effect. And there's actually a book uh, called The Compound Effect. I forget the author's name, but it was a very good book. Along the, Speaking of like along the same lines that we talked about last time with the domino effect and how one domino can actually knock over another domino that's 50% bigger than it. And if you extrapolate that out, you'd by like the 50th domino, you'd end up with the domino that's like reaches the moon. Crazy. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the lies. They mislead and derail us. So what exactly are the lies? Well, there's six of them that Gary lists out here. And he starts off with this saying truthiness, which comes from Stephen Colbert. I remember when he said this, uh, truth and what it means is that truth that comes from the gut, not books. In an information age driven by round-the-clock news, editorless blogging, truthiness captures all the incidental, accidental, and even intentional falsehoods that just sound truthy enough for us to accept as true. Kind of sounds like some 1984 stuff. It's kind of funny. We just finished 1984. But the one thing becomes difficult when you have bought into many other things besides the one thing, especially if you've never done anything related to the concepts in the one thing. You end up holding on to all that past, those, those past behaviors and I don't want to say activities, but past behaviors and ways of going about your life. That when you hear about the one thing, it's hard to let go of those other things and start applying the principles from the one thing. So Gary brings up a couple other lies that they tell us or that you hear, catchphrases and stuff like, bet on the jockey, not the horse. You know, as as in like you bet on the person leading the company and not the company itself. And then he goes on to explain, well, people leave companies like all the time. Yeah, sure. You get CEOs and stuff that stick with certain companies for a long time, but I don't know. I feel like people come and go maybe at the lower levels, especially now with quote unquote, like this great reg resignation. And maybe that's, a, maybe that's a little bit lower, lower employees on the total poll, but still uh, another lie. The frog in the boiling water metaphor. Toss a frog in a pot of water and it will jump right back out. But if you place a frog in lukewarm water, it will boil to death. I think Gary says it's a lie. It's a very truthy lie, but a lie nonetheless. Fish stink from the head down. Not true. I'm pretty sure fish just stink. So these lies, much like these kind of catchphrases, they just get perpetuated and perpetuated and then you end up clinging on to them and then it's hard to let go 
kind of reminds me again of when we were reading the four agreements and how you have past agreements that have just been indoctrinated into you that it's hard to let go of. And the way forward is to break those old agreements, replace them with these new positive agreements that don't suck away your energy. So here's where Gary lists off the six lies that keep us from the one thing. We're going to talk about the first one in this episode. So one, everything matters equally. Two, multitasking. Three, a disciplined life. I feel like that would be a positive thing, right? Hmm. Willpower is always on will call a balanced life. Interesting. Again, I always thought that was kind of a positive thing. Big is bad. Hmm. So that's an interesting list. If you guys look at this list, you're probably thinking, like me, dude, I definitely multitask. (laughs) And I feel like I get stuff done. Or you think, like, dang, you know, everything matters equally. I feel like sometimes all the tasks I do in a day, they do matter equally. I Like, I got to get them all done. Or, like, I, I thought being disciplined is, like, a very good thing. Like, Jocko's, Jocko Willing's book, Discipline Equals Freedom. Or a balanced life. Like, yeah, I, I always say that. You got to have balance. Hmm. So I wonder what he means by these. And I'm, I'm curious. I know I've read the book before, but it's been a while. So I'm eager to reread some of these chapters and see what Gary was talking about here. But we're going to start off with the first one. Everything matters equally. And Gary just right off the bat just hits us in the face with this saying that equality is great, justice, human rights, it's great. Yes. But in life, many things are not equal. I am not equal to some of my coworkers in my coding skills. You know, I am not equal to the other people that I train with in jiu-jitsu. There's lots of people who are better than me. Right in in life, equality is not really a thing. Like out in some areas of life, it, it doesn't happen. He continues on that as we progress through life, as we age, we start from doing things that we need to do because it, we're told they got to get done, and then as we age, we get a lot more discretionary leeway into the things that we want to do as kids we got to get up eat breakfast go to school do our homework and that's kind of the mindset that we have is hey we have to do all these things well and then later on as adults it's like hey uh i don't really feel like doing that or i don't really need to eat breakfast today Uh, i'm gonna put this off until tomorrow so you have more discretionary decision making when you're an adult. And when you're an adult, everything feels urgent. So when everything feels urgent, I don't want to say everything feels urgent, but when, especially when you have a task list or you're starting to ponder like, hey, what do I got to get accomplished today? When everything feels urgent, everything seems equal. And I love this quote by Gary here. Activity does not equal productivity. I have a really bad tendency. I have a list. I have a whiteboard right over here that I write stuff down on. And I'll bullet point things that I need to get done within the day or within the week. And it feels like, hey, I did a lot this week. But was it productive? Is it a grocery list or is it a success list? We're going to talk about that in a slide or two. So how do you decide what to do first? I know this is kind of an open-end question. How do you decide what to do first? If you have this huge list of things, how do you dwindle it down to the one thing? And that's really what the goal of a list is. It should just be the one thing, the one vital thing. So Gary goes on to talk about these to-do lists and how these to-do lists can trivialize us with stuff that we are obligated to get done. It's an inbox mentality. If I 
first thing in the morning, like when I'm logged in for work and I'm looking at my emails, that inbox mentality is like you pay the most attention to the most recent task. So the squeakiest wheel gets the grease. The email at the top of your inbox always gets like the most intention. But as Gary talks about in the book, sometimes those most important things often don't really squeak or they don't really squeak that loud. And yet we pay most attention to just kind of the most recent thing on the inbox and we go down from there, even though the most important thing might be the 50th thing in your inbox but it's just buried down there that you never really notice it. And it's not really squeaking that loud. So instead of working from a recency, top-down approach, numerical approach, you work from priority. Ultimately, what Gary talks about in this section is that lists lead you astray. Lists are things you think you need to do. And achievers always work from a clear sense of priority. So what do you need instead of a to-do list? You need a success list. Now, what is a success list? Well, he continues on and he tells this story about the late 1930s at General Motors. Shout out, Michigan. At General Motors, Motors, Mortars, <laughs> at General Motors, they had an amazing breakthrough with one of their card readers, early input devices for early computers, started producing gibberish, and they found out that they stumbled on a way to encode secret messages. This was a big deal at the time since Germany's infamous Enigma coding machines first appeared in World War I. Both code making and code breaking were stuff of high national security and even higher public curiosity. So the GM managers thought that this cipher that they discovered was unbreakable. One man, Joseph M. Geron, made a challenge. He disagreed. He took up the code-breaking challenge and cracked the code by 3 o'clock the following morning when he arrived on the premises. Joseph M. Duran cited this incident as the starting point for cracking an even bigger code and making one of his greatest contributions to science and business. A GM executive invited him to review research on management compensation that followed a formula described by little-known Italian economist Vilfredo Perito. And this is a powerful principle. We might have mentioned this in other videos, too, about the Perito principle where this guy Perito discovered that in Italy at the time of his, the time that he was living, 19th century, Italy's 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the people. So Geron noticed similar things in his business, in his line of work. Geron noticed a handful of flaws usually produce a majority of the defects. The so-called 80-20 rule, and there is, Gary actually cites a book uh, by Richard Koch, The 80-20 Principle, which I've heard, I've never read, but I've heard good things about it. The majority of what you want will come from a minority of what you do. And this extrapolates to a lot of things in life. And it's important to note here that we shouldn't focus on, oh, it's exactly 80% or it's exactly 20%. What Gary talks about in here is that you don't focus on the percentage. Basically, you focus on this last bullet point here. The majority of what you want will come from a a minority what you do. So it's a skewed distribution. Most of what is accomplished is done by the minority of people. Or most of what you accomplish is done by a minority amount of time doing that thing, if I'm explaining that correctly. So it it doesn't have to be 80-20, guys. It could be 90-10. It could be 65-20. 
I realize that doesn't add up to 100%, but right, it's basically most of the accomplishments are done by a small subset of work that you do during the day. Because think about this. With me at work, the totality of activity that I do at work and just a little sliver of that activity is actually used to accomplish like coding stories. Other, other stuff is filled with answering emails, administrative tasks, meetings, etc. But that small sliver of coding that I do actually puts forth the most productivity. The majority of the productive work that is accomplished in the day is all I'm trying to say. So here's where Gary's going to talk about, well, okay, we still haven't really answered this question. How do you get the success list? How do you break away from list, uh, list purgatory? There's the word, list purgatory, break out of that. Well, you have to identify your 20% out of the total to-do list. That 20% that makes a difference towards the 80%. And Gary calls this an extreme Pareto because then you take 20% of that 20% until you get to one thing. I want you to go, so Gary writes, I want you to go small by identifying the 20%, and then I want you to go even smaller by finding the vital few of the vital few until you get to the one thing. So you start off with that big list, then you dwindle it down to the vital few, and then you dwindle it down to the one thing. So Gary tells a story back in 2001, he had a meeting he challenged a group to brainstorm a hundred ways to turn this situation around. They were growing, but they were still not acknowledged by the very top people in the industry. The next morning, they found the list of a hundred. Then next, they dwindled that list down to 10 ideas. And then from there, we chose just one big idea. And if you stop and think, I've never really... I've never done this before. I always make lists and I feel like, hey, I got to do everything on here. But if you dwindle that list down to one thing, it's got to be tough, right? Got to be tough, but it's also got to be worth it because you're dwindling it down to just the one thing that you need to do that makes everything else easier. And I guess that's the question that you need to ask when you're going through a big list and you're chopping it down to your one thing. What's the one thing on this list that by doing it and accomplishing it, it makes everything else easier? I got to tell you, I had this, I actually had this recently where I knew I still needed to complete my taxes for the year. And it was kind of causing me a lot of stress. I put everything else aside and I said, you know what? If I can complete this, it makes my life that much easier and puts me at a better state. And that question is going to be different for everybody. For some other people, hey, taxes, super easy, doesn't cause me a lot of stress. I don't have to worry about that. But for me, that was my one important thing. And this, this is going to change for people to people. It's going to be different. But I challenge you and I challenge myself to try this, to dwindle down next time you have a list building up of things you got to do, dwindle it down to just one thing. What's the one thing that by doing it makes everything else easier? Last, this is just kind of like a small summary of things from the chapter. So the big ideas from the chapter about uh, going small. Don't focus on being busy. Focus on being productive. We talked about that. Less on activity, more on productivity. Go extreme. So the extreme Pareto principle where, hey, you start off with this big list, dwindling it down to the vital few, and then dwindle that down to your one thing. Say no. Whether you say later or never, the point is to say not now. I remember I heard, I've heard this before that, 
the really successful people are great at saying no. They don't say yes to like most things, but the things that they end up saying yes to end up devoting a lot of their attention and focus. If you say yes to everything, then you often get pulled in all kinds of different directions and you're not able to focus on, well, one thing. Don't get trapped in the checkoff game. Again, I I do this with my list. I get trapped in the checkoff game where I feel like I'm accomplishing a lot because things are just getting checked off the list. But are they the vital things, the vital few, that one thing? Probably not. Most of the time, they probably aren't. And the, the last thing here, this is, uh, kind of, this is kind of my quote. Because Gary says in, in the last sentence here of the chapter, doing the most important thing is always the most important thing. And there's a Stephen Covey book, uh, First Things First. And he his quote from that book is, keep, I, I misspelled this again, <laughs> keep your main thing the main thing. First things first. And nothing, I don't want to say nothing will go wrong, but you know you'll be in the right direction. Your compass will be in the right direction. And guys, that's going to do it today for The One Thing. Uh, Next time we will go over Chapter 5, The Lies They Tell Us About Multitasking. And guys, I really appreciate you sticking around with me till the end here. Thank you very much. Hopefully you're enjoying The One Thing. Hopefully, I'm doing a good job explaining the one thing. Let me know your comments, questions, what have you. Uh, Check out that blog. I wrote a blog post on my one thing and my journey through having a one thing a few years ago uh, when I went through a coding boot camp, and that was my one thing for several months. Uh, You can find the link to the blog in the description of the video. That's going to wrap it up. Guys, thank you very much for listening. My name is Chris. This has been Cheatash. Take care.